a lot of why we do the deals we do is my reaction to what I mm. perceive to be stupid business traditions. Look them in the eye and you tell them up front, here's the good news. Here's the bad news. Our last page is a list of all the quote unquote bad things. And it's just repeating what could piss them off five years later. And they have to initial it. Nobody has refused to sign it. We will tell them openly. Yeah. We had a comedian who went nuts. Was like, you didn't say this. You didn't say that. Not only did we not say anything you're saying we said. Not only is everything you're complaining about in the contract, you signed it. We shine a spotlight on this for you. We added this thing for extra moral protection. What's going on? Welcome to the new music business. I'm your host, Ari Herstand, author of How to Make It in the New Music Business, third edition coming very soon. Today, my guest is actually does not work in the music industry. And this is, I think, the first guest we've had that doesn't um, exclusively work in the music industry. He does work in the entertainment industry, specifically the comedy world. Now, I've always found some parallels between the comedy industry and the music industry, but don't turn it off. Even if you're not interested in the comedy industry, there are some incredible revelations here. I hope we have some record labels listening because the way that Brian runs his record label, we can all learn a lot from in music. My guest today is Brian Volk Weiss, and he is, he runs the most successful independent comedy record label in the world. It's the largest independent stand-up comedy production and distribution label, Comedy Dynamics. They uh, work with some artists, just to name a few, Kevin Hart, Tiffany Haddish, Ali Wong, Jim Gaffigan, Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, Tom Segura. I could go on and on. It's essentially the who's who of comedy. It's, it's everyone. I mean... Amy Schumer, Bo Burnham, I mean, just just uh, on and on and on. He is who you talk to when you are working in comedy and want to make a, a stand-up special. They have produced hundreds of stand-up specials and then turn those stand-up specials into albums. They have won five Grammys. Uh, they now since, uh, now the label, he started in 2017, mind you. It's a very new label. And in 2019, get this, every comedy album that was nominated for a Grammy was Brian's, was from Comedy Dynamics. That's pretty cool. I can't tell you a time in history when one record label had every nominee in the same category. So we talk about how to go about the Grammy nominating process, how his his albums get nominated for Grammys, but more so how he got to where he's at, how he structures and runs his label. It's very fascinating. We talk about Prince a little bit and just the differences between major record contracts and comedy dynamics record contracts. Everyone is going to learn a lot, whether you care about comedy or not. This definitely listen to this episode. And if you're coming here from the comedy industry, welcome. Most of our episodes about the music industry, but likewise, how musicians and music industry professionals can learn a tremendous amount from the comedy industry. It goes both ways. Um, and I know we have some comedians uh, as listeners as well. So this one especially is for you. Speaking of which, please subscribe to the show. If this is your first time or you've been listening for a while, pause it right now. Hit that subscribe. Hit that follow button if you want us to appear in your feed. And if you've been listening for a while and you'd love to leave us a review, a five-star review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts would be super helpful. That really helps. Very appreciated. I read the reviews uh for better or worse but if you love the show leave me a review if you hate it shoot me an email my email's not hard to find i'll get back to you if you're listening on youtube leave a comment i'd love to respond to the comments and you can find us all that make the show happen on instagram twitter and tiktok at ari's take find me on instagram and twitter at ari her stand. Visit ariestech.com. Get on the email list. That's where the most important information, we send it out regularly there. All right, let's kick into the show. Brian, Volk Weiss, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me, Ari. So um, for those of you who are just listening um, and not don't have the, the magic of the visuals that I have right now, um, 
it seems that uh, that you're a fan here, um, and and if you could explain this fandom that I'm witnessing behind you, I, I'm going on this this magical intergalactic journey right now. Um, uh, discuss what what I'm what I'm seeing behind you. <laughs> yes. Uh, my, by the way, my favorite reaction to my background uh, was uh, Ian um, Mick. I'm sure I'm butchering this. Uh, Mick uh, Mick Diamond or something uh-huh. like that. He plays the emperor in star wars uh he saw my background he goes are you in a vegetable storage facility (laughs) uh no uh i am a toy collector uh i have over 3300 uh pieces uh to Mm. put it nicely my wife would say pieces of crap (laughs) <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, before COVID, uh, this was my collection room uh-huh. and, uh, since COVID, uh, about now, thank God it's only about 10% of the time. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you, for whatever reason today I'm, uh, working from my office at home, but yes, yeah. this is, uh, a tiny slice of my, uh, toy collection. You're in like, just a general toy collector or a star specific star wars toy collector so like i said there's like about 3300 pieces yeah um i would say star wars and star trek combined Mm -hmm. are half the collection gotcha and then after those it would be gi joe then it would be batman and then every and then I would say probably about a third of the collection is just random, 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 random. Amazing. Oh, my gosh. Well, uh, I know there was a documentary out there that featured some of your toy collection. And so um, that's something that we can all take a, a take a look at if you want to learn more. But the we're not here today. That made us on Netflix. Where it Thank all you. Began. The toys that made us. Yes. Yes. Go check that out. Um all right, so we're not here today necessarily to talk about toys, and and actually, I think of what? the near hundred, yeah, the near hundred guests that I've had on the New Music Business podcast. I think you're the first one uh, and only one that doesn't uh, primarily work in the music industry, and I thought it was interesting to have you on the show because there are a lot of parallels with the comedy industry and the music industry, and I'm fascinated by the comedy industry. I love personally, I love comedy. Uh, I get to as many shows as I can and I watch as many specials as I can. Um, but, um, you know, as someone running the, I believe, the largest independent comedy label out there, uh, you have an interesting perspective in kind of what it takes um, to put out releases. And I think there's a lot of parallels, specifically when it comes to the Grammys, which I know a lot of my audience is, is interested in and kind of how you went about that process. But, um, I want to kind of step back a little bit and we'll get to uh, the inception of Comedy Dynamic Records and all of that. But kind of just step me through how you broke into the comedy industry. I know you've done a lot of film work and TV work and producing and directing and all of that stuff. But for the most part, what led you to be the most, uh, the largest independent comedy label in the world? Uh, it was as random as it gets. I moved out to L.A. I mean, so much of this is cliched. Apologies uh, in advance. Uh, I moved out to L.A. I didn't know anybody. Um, I worked every job. I worked every job except for camera department. I was a grip. I was an electric. I did everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's a great way to burn through your life savings when you're 22. uh, Because I worked for free like 99% of the time. (laughs) Sure. So I was broke, uh, but I also knew everything I'd been doing was on set mm-hmm. and I wanted to get earlier in the process. So, I mean, literally, I used to go to this like breakfast club at seven in the morning at the farmer's market and some random guy. I mean, I didn't even know the guy. He was like the friend of a friend of a friend. He came to one of the breakfasts, never saw him again. But at that breakfast, he introduced me to someone else who, long story short, got me an internship and that internship down the hallway uh, because, again, I wasn't getting paid. And I like literally was like trying to get a job as a waiter. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was out of money. And uh, randomly, uh, there was a guy down the hall, uh, an assistant who was quitting and his boss was a manager 
Now, I didn't even know what a manager did. Like, sure. I had no idea. But all I knew, and this is all I needed to know when you're 22 years old, uh, he was playing, paying 50 bucks a day cash <laughs> to be an assistant. Sure. I interviewed. I got the gig. He only managed stand-up comedians. That's okay. it. And I, at that time in my life, had only been to a stand-up comedy club once. Mm -hmm. I did not enjoy it. I literally <laughs> had, like, ducked out and missed three quarters of the show. Sure. The only comedian I remember was Todd Barry, uh, mm -hmm. who was great. Oh, yeah. And um, that, Friday, that Saturday, um, just to see what the company did. Like, I was just curious. Like, what does mm -hmm. our, what does a management company do? I went to the Laugh Factory. I was uh, I was given free tickets to the seven o'clock show. Mm -hmm. uh, I watched the show. I left. And because I didn't know anybody and I was brand new, I got on the line with 300 other people paid for the 10 o'clock show. The 10 o'clock show ended. I got back on the line <laughs> and I paid for the midnight show. And I literally watched like not, almost seven hours of comedy on that first Saturday night. And I became obsessed with it. I mean, absolutely yeah. obsessed. I didn't know anything about anything. Like yeah. the only special I'd ever seen was Eddie Murphy raw. Sure. But like, I would say within six months, I had probably seen 90%, which was easy to do back then. I had seen 90% of every standup special ever made. Mm. And then I became a manager. Mm. Uh, and I also, only represented comedians. Oh, wow. And that's and how it started. Amazing. And what year are we talking here where you were on the line and you, you got your introduction? 1999. Okay. It was March yeah. of 99. Nice. So um, you were a manager for uh, comics for uh, years. Now, t tell me kind of, uh, did you, were you taking, I'm assuming you're starting with comics that were kind of getting started as you're building your career, well, these comedians are building their career. <laughs> I I'm I'm worried. I've already told you a long story. So if this next story is too long, please interrupt okay, me. I'll... But by the way, if anybody wants to know how random management is, yeah, this is the best. I had a very 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 unusual career. Mm -hmm. When I was still the assistant to the boss, the first new Star Wars movie was coming out in twenty years. Uh huh. And there were these things a lot of people may not remember called line teams. And a line team, uh, when a movie like Star Wars, because now it's normal for big things like this to come back. But back uh -huh. in 1999, uh, nothing like this had ever happened. Mm -hmm. So you had to get on line teams and like wait weeks to get tickets. So obviously no per one person is going to wait uh, for weeks to get a oh. ticket. So I was part of an eight person line team <laughs> oh and I was, gosh. you know, I would put in my six hour shifts every yeah. four days or whatever. I'm bad at math every two days, whatever it was. And then one day, one of these young comedians I had never heard of in my life was a Star Wars fan, which uh -huh. again, in 2022, you're like, who gives a shit? Like everybody's a Star <laughs> Wars fan. Yeah. It was a big deal to find a like minded Star Wars fan. Sure. And he asked me, I know it's really not cool. And it was not cool. This was a yeah. big deal. Yeah. Um, he asked me if I would get him a ticket. And I did. I and I remember I was only supposed to buy one. That's how it worked. Uh -huh. And I bought two. And that was the because, again, it's not fair to all the other people in line. Sure. that you're, If everybody did that, the people in line wouldn't be able to get tickets themselves. Yeah. But for whatever reason, and I really thought about it, man, other people would say that they <laughs> preyed on it. I mean, sure. it really bothered me. But for some reason, and I, I'm the last person to normally break rules like this, mm -hmm. I got the guy a ticket. And we became great friends. Mm. And when we became, when I became a manager, because that story I just told you, I was the assistant. Sure. When I became a manager, he became one of my first clients and I shared him. Don't get me wrong with the big boss. Sure. But at the time, this guy could barely sell four or 500 tickets. Uh, cut to 
Yeah. Uh, about two and a half years later, I mean, I'm not even 30. Like, yeah. I, I think I was like 26. Um, he became the biggest comedian in 35 years. His name is Dane Cook. Um, of course, and, he's at the top of the Laugh Factory. If you <laughs> drive down Sunset Strip, his name is still right up top there. Incredible. Exactly. And it has The first one to sell out MSG, I think, Dane Cook? Second. He, he, second second well, one to sell out. Actually, Can third. You? Third. Okay. Uh, it was uh, Steve Martin, Andrew Dice Clay, and uh, then Dane. Dane Cook. But what people don't understand is in 2022, it's like, well, who cares? Bill Burr, uh, Gl Glacius, Kevin Hart, Aziz. Sebastian, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So in 2022, there's probably between 15 and 20 comedians that can sell out MSG. Mm -hmm. When Dane did MSG, he was the third human being comedian ever yeah. to have done it. And not only that, I have to give Dane credit. He did it in the round because when Dice and uh, Steve Martin did it, it was not in the round. So Dane <laughs> so actually more really did. Yeah. Well, no, he, I mean, he really did sell it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. You're managing Dane Cook. You're you're uh, you've now become a manager. I'm assuming because he uh, quickly becomes the largest comic in the world. Uh, that opens the door. Other comedians was like, "Well, I I want to work with who Dane's work with. Man, his career's taken off." And so uh, you're you're taking more meetings. You, do you build out no. your roster, or, or what happens no. then? I, okay. No, I wish that had happened. To be completely honest with you. Uh, if that had happened, yeah. uh, there's a very good chance not only would I still be a manager, I'll be completely honest with you. I don't know if I would have built the company the way I did. OK. Um, Dane was a very controversial comedian. Yeah. Um, and that is me being diplomatic. Uh, there's a better word I could use, but I'll stick with uh, 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 controversial. Sure. Uh, because he was controversial, uh, we did not. I mean, as a company. We actually not only did not receive a single incoming call because of Dane, uh, we actually didn't get a lot of calls because mm. of Dane. Wow. So like a lot of comedians didn't want to be at the company where Dane was represented. Gotcha. So what actually happened was because Dane blew up so quickly, mm -hmm. um, and I mean like life-changing quickness in you know, yeah. about – 80 days. Wow. Um, I mean, I went from being bonkers in debt, bonkers broke, worried about my car getting repossessed. Not, yeah. not a metaphor. Yeah. That's real. Yeah. Uh, to like basically not having to worry about money uh, yeah. over an 80 day period. So a lot of people go from broke to wealthy. Uh, it usually doesn't take 80 days. Yeah. So, <laughs> right, right. right. So that was the good news. The bad news was because Dane was such a big, and it wasn't really bad news, but because Dane was such a big business, mm -hmm. um, I basically scaled back how many clients I had drastically gotcha. and then went on the road with him. I mean, I was on every tour. I was oh, wow. on every movie. I was there every single day, practically. Sure. So I, I mean, I went from having about 20 clients to having four clients mm. uh, over the course of about three months. Mm. So when did you part ways? When did you stop working with Dane and stop managing clients? I'm really, well, okay. So I stopped managing Dane and I retired. Yeah. Um, that for a manager, by the way, is like a gunslinger dying with his boots off. <laughs> <laughs> like it's it's a it's a big deal to be a manager retiring. Normally sure. it's not a normally it's not a voluntary decision. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I retired from Dane, I believe, and as a manager, I think in 2011. If, okay. if I'm wrong, it was 2010. Yeah. Uh, it was one. I believe it was 2011. And was there an impetus? Was there something that was like, you know what, management is no longer for me? Was the light were you was the the road life challenging? Was it just dealing, you know, 24-7 having to be on call with your clients? Was it just like the lifestyle? Or just did you lose interest in that line of work? Why did you decide to to retire at what? 40, 35? <laughs> well then I, I didn't retire from show business. I just yeah. retired from management. Yeah. Um, here's listen, I am not other than being an actor. And I know this is ironic. Yeah. 
Um, but it prob a probably leads to B. Um, mm. Other than being an actor, I am not aware of a worse job that exists than being a manager. And I can give you proof without using myself as an example. Okay. Uh, there is a manager. Uh, he is probably one of the most successful managers in history. Mm -hmm. I would say in a bad year, he makes 12 million. But I would say he probably makes around $20 million a year. Wow. Uh, I have never seen him. And he didn't say to me almost immediately how jealous he is that I've retired. Wow. So if you have the number one most successful, like imagine if Michael Jordan went around 24-7 mm -hmm. complaining about how much he hates basketball. Yeah, yeah. That's what this guy is to management. Mm. So that being said, um, it's a horrible life. As yeah. I mentioned earlier, Dane was controversial, um, which is not the exact right word to use here, but it's the word I will use. Sure. Uh, and to be honest with you, our other businesses, especially our stand-up comedy business, was maturing so quickly. And we had actually built up a really nice library mm -hmm. that it just didn't make sense anymore to, you know, put myself out there like that. I, I, I realized I could make more money and have a better life mm -hmm. just producing and building my company sure. than I did managing for people. Well, you know, that takes um, a lot of courage to go out and, and to stop doing something that you're familiar with and that uh, you've proven that you can do and to leave that behind and pivot and essentially start a new career. I mean, that um, I think, you know, we've been seeing in the great resignation and the great reset over the last couple of years, a lot of people. Uh, doing that because they're prioritizing their happiness and their well-being and their quality of life um, over uh, stability, I guess, immediate um, career stability because they are choosing a different life that they want and, and they want to structure their life in a way that is going to prioritize well-being and happiness, which I think is is really crucial and important. So, um, you know, it worked out for you. But, but let's fast forward to 2017 when you launched um, Comedy Dynamic Records, because uh, I want to I want to get into to this a bit as as running a record label. Now, you know, most people listening to this are in the music industry, but I I bet there's going to be some parallels here. What inspired you to launch the record label, and how did how did you do that? Again, you know, it's funny. I always go out of my way to point out how random my career has been because I get a lot of press about how I'm very smart and I'm a genius and I saw the future coming. And at least from my point of view, none of that is true. Um, it's all been very random and very okay. lucky. So, and again, don't get me wrong. I worked really hard, but... Yes. It, it, I know lots of people who have worked hard and have not been able to do what they wanted to do. So it really is, a, I mean, a tremendous percentage of luck. But um, basically what happened was we started making stand-up specials uh, for non-clients. So when I started making stand-up specials... And who's we they, at this time? Well, at the time, I was an employee okay. uh, and the company was called New Wave. Got it. So, um, and the management company, the small management company I worked for mm -hmm. from 1993, 1999, mm -hmm. um, a bigger company called New Wave bought his, my old boss's company in 2003. Okay. And then I, in 2017, bought the bigger company. Um, so I was an employee there for like 15 years. Got it. So, what happened was um, I had just been making stand-up specials for my comedian clients and I was mm -hmm. making two or three a year, to be honest with you, sometimes one or zero. Mm -hmm. And one day I got a call from an agent and the agent was like, hey, what do you think about doing a stand-up special for Michael Ian Black? Uh, the guy's name was Michael Berkowitz or mm -hmm. Mike Berkowitz. I don't know why I just called him Michael. I have never called him Michael. <laughs> Mike Berkowitz. So Mike Berkowitz called me about yeah, Michael Ian Black. That's why I called him Michael. And uh -huh. um, 
he uh, I got very angry. And it, well, no, the first question I asked is, does Michael need a manager? Uh-huh. And he's like, no, he's been with the same manager for 20 years. He's fine. And I'm like, mm-hmm. and I got angry. Mm-hmm. I was like, dude, I'm not here to just fucking make people stand up specials. Come on. Like, yeah. call me when he needs a manager. Yeah. The next day in the shower, I was like, you know what? I'm pretty sure my job is to make money as long as it's legal. So I called him back. I apologized. <laughs> and that was our first stand up special that we made. It's the first mm. time the company ever did anything not with a client. So mm. that is exhibit A. You might okay. be wondering, when am I going to answer your question? Here it comes. <laughs> so exhibit B, uh, again, sort of lucky, uh, but through Dane, I had, of course, become friends with the guy who ran Comedy Central Records, mm-hmm. a guy named Jack Vaughn, who right mm-hmm. now is running all of comedy for Sirius. And even though I had produced albums with uh, Dane and other comedians for Jack Mm -hmm. and Jack had given other clients of mine record deals. It was only when we started producing our own album, our own standup specials, Jack had said to me, I'm just curious, you're making all these specials. You own them. Why aren't you putting out albums? Hmm. So because he was my friend and because it wasn't a lot of work, uh, we started just giving him the albums and he put them on Comedy Central and everything was great. Yeah. And then one day after I read a book called The Long Tail and that book, which I read in 2006, that book is what inspired me to do everything I've done. Mm. Um, I basically asked Jack if he thought we could launch our own record label. Um, And he very nicely, because, again, this would be in competition with Comedy Central, he very nicely said, he's like, listen, if I am being honest with you, yeah, it's kind of stupid you don't have one. (laughs) And that's when we launched our record album. And I'll be completely honest with you. Yeah. The day we launched, dude, maybe the first six months we launched. I didn't understand. I didn't get it. I didn't know Mm. what sound exchange was. I didn't understand. Like, I didn't get it. Like, to me, audio was like the icing on the cake. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't go so far as today to say that audio is the cake. It absolutely is not. Yeah. But I would say that audio is half the cake and half the icing. And in the comedy industry, you're saying the other half is the stand-up the specials, the live yeah. uh, performance and, and all of that? Yes, because the same way we're a record label distributing records, we're mm-hmm. also a video distributor. So we distribute the video to hundreds of places every day. Mm. Uh, and then we also do a lot of license deals, too. So we'll license like. You know, we did Ali Wong's first stand-up special on spec. We're one Mm -hmm. of the only companies that regularly, like we do before COVID, we did 20 to 30 spec specials a year. And what does that that mean that you produce it without a network attached from the get-go? Okay. We finance it. it. Yes. Got it. So we, so using Ali as the example, Mm -hmm. like we did her special on spec and then we licensed it to Netflix. So mm. that was not originally a Netflix special. Same thing with Tom Segura. Same thing with Tiffany Haddish with Showtime. Mm. So like if you see Tiffany Haddish's first special on Pluto or Roku or Samsung or Peacock today. Sure. That's ours. Like mm. that's not Showtime's. Gotcha. So the audio was always like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. But yeah. eventually it became pretty apparent. Uh, it is not a whatever. Right. And so now when you're doing deals or producing stand-up specials or even negotiating a stand-up special, um, is it always tied to the audio rights as well? Whereas before, were you just ignoring the audio rights and, and those oh, no. capacities? We always got the rights. Don't get me you wrong. You just didn't explore yeah. it. No, we did. But I guess what I would say is we didn't do it in a systematic way. Okay. So. You know, and then the other thing I should mention is, like I said, I read that book, that book, Mm -hmm. like before I read The Long Tail, we were making, I would say, between three and five specials a year. Right. After I read the book, I think the first full 12 months after I read the book, we made 15 specials. And then 
Uh, and like I said, I read the book in 06. And in 2019, the last full year before COVID, mm -hmm. I mean, we made 32 specials. So what that did was that gave us the volume sure. to actually be a label. Mm. Um, but on top of that, to further answer your question, on top of that, I mean, we also started very aggressively producing album only deals and okay. then also acquiring specials. Mm. So we make, I mean, I would say a quarter of our releases um, on the audio, on the record division side, uh, a quarter of our albums are um, album only. So uh, that's interesting. I didn't actually realize there were any comedy album only um, records. I thought they yeah. all came from specials. So, sure. um, so now is your approach um, when you do a special? It it's systematic. It it automatically the album is released like the, it, it know, always the same is day or always. Yeah, okay. Okay. We've we've done I think about two hundred and forty specials. Mm -hmm. I would say. At the most five, we didn't have the audio rights. And the mm -hmm. reason for that is they had pre-existing deals mm -hmm. and I wanted the video so badly, I agreed to do it. But, and by the way, I'm telling you five to be safe. Yeah. yeah. I think the real number is two or three. So when you said that audio is about 50% of the business, now break that down a little bit. Are we talking streaming royalties from Spotify, Apple Music? Is this where the money is coming from? And Sound Exchange, you mentioned a little bit of that. I mean, where, where's the money coming from, really? The majority, the vast majority of the money is digital. Yeah. So okay. it's, you know, it's Apple, it's iTunes, Amazon, what have you. Sure. And then, of course, Sound Exchange. And explain Sound Exchange a little bit because at, on the music side, you know, uh, we're familiar with Sound Exchange that pays the record labels and the featured artists, the actual artists, not the songwriters, which we can get into a little bit later, but it's the the artists themselves, the feature performers, what they call it on Sound Exchange, and it's typically for digital radio, which I'm assuming, you know, like Pandora, Sirius XM. Um, is that big business for comedy? Is there is there uh, the comedy specials being played on Pandora, Sirius XM, iHeart, those digital radio stations? That's why there's a significant money amount coming to comedy. Uh, on Sirius alone, uh, there are six comedy channels. Oh wow! Like, okay, um, Pandora I has, I believe, two. Um, uh -huh. I mean, there it's a huge business, huge and, cool. and growing. Yeah. yeah. Fast. Cool. That's, that's, um, that's great to hear. I, I, yeah, I wasn't familiar with that. Now, what is, um, now when it comes to you're an independent record label and you've been nominated, you've won, uh, like I guess five Grammys nominated for a bunch of Grammys. I think I read in, in 2019, you had, was it every album that was nominated for, a Grammy that year or something like that. Um, yeah. Send me through the process of how you go about getting nominated for a Grammy. Dude, it's so complicated. I don't even know <laughs> if you'll understand it, but I'll hit me. I will talk. <laughs> Try it. I will talk slowly. I will talk yes. slowly for your benefit. Thank you. Uh, we submit a list uh, and then they tell us what got in. So, well, let's get a little bit more uh, detail with that. So you submit a list to whom and how? We send a list to the Grammy Association of okay. every album we put out. Okay. Uh, then that list gets uh, turned. They then turn it into somehow on their own, uh, turn it into a shorter list. Mm -hmm. Then that shorter list because again, we put out about 150 albums a year, more than that right. actually. Mm -hmm. So it then gets reduced to let's say 20 albums. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, I'm sure there's an answer as to how they do that. I just don't know it. Sure. Um, then those 20 albums, the Grammy sends a giant email form to all voting members. Mm -hmm. All of those are on the form. Whoever gets the most votes gets yeah. a nomination. Mm -hmm. And then whoever gets a nomination, whoever gets the most votes wins. 
So right, it's it's the Recording Academy, um, and yes, there are a few rounds um, of voting. Where it's like I've seen the list of the first round, uh, which is endless. And I mean, I guess it helps because a lot of the albums that you have, I mean, a lot of these um, are from recognizable names. I mean, we're talking, you know, Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock and Patton Oswalt, um, Jim Gaffigan and and um, on and on and on. So um, that probably makes it a little bit easier. These are recognizable names. Now, how did you develop the catalog um, to this extent? Was it just from acquiring the rights from Comedy Central Records? And that's how you initially uh, grew the catalog? Or was it, I, I think I read somewhere that you you actually are now the the distributor for Comedy Central Records, but prior to that deal, when you you were just having you know your own catalog and, and your own releases without Comedy Central's catalog, um, how where were you obtaining these rights from? Were these comedians striking deals directly with you, signing record deals directly with you, these production deals, or was it working alongside studios that had existing deals? Kind of step me through the nuances of where all these rights came from. Yeah, I mean, if we're only talking about the Grammys, I mean, Comedy Central was not relevant at all. I mean, we just okay. started distributing Comedy Central this this January gotcha. of 2022, okay. and we just got their back catalog. So all of our nominations and all of our wins came about in one of two ways. The first is we produced the album. Uh, based on a special or something like that. Like we mm. made it ourselves from scratch. Yeah. And then we distributed it and it got a nomination. Uh-huh. Uh, and sometimes one. Uh, that's half of it. The other half is somebody else made a special mm -hmm. and uh, they needed a, a record label to produce the record. Uh, and we produced the record for them, even though okay. we didn't produce the special. Got and it. that's what happened with Chris, with um, Chappelle and Louis. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so breakdown. I'm very curious. I don't know uh, really the comedy industry in the inner workings. I know the music industry very well, but I'm curious how record deals work in the comedy industry. Do you? Is it per special? Is it just you're signing a one album deal? Do you have options of additional albums that are in there? What's the royalty breakdown? Where's the ownership fall? How does this all work? Break down a typical record deal, a, a deal for comedy. Um, I'm going to do my best to answer all your questions, but I have a horrible <laughs> memory. So if I forget one, apologies. <laughs> sure. And it goes without saying, I can only tell you about our deals. Okay. I don't, I don't, I either don't know how other companies don't work, work or uh, it's not my place to say how they do. Sure. But if I'm just speaking for us. Yeah. Uh, uh, can you ask them one at a time? Yes, let's go one at a time. Thank you. Make this um, easy. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, number one, are you how many album deals do you um, work with? So, is it a one Got album it. deal? Yes. Like multiple so albums? This, How does that work? So, okay. So, I'm so glad you asked this. Um, a lot of how I run the company is based on my experiences as a manager. Okay. So there are things that I do that are kind of weird in some ways, um, but I believe in the long run actually will make more money. Okay. Um, you could not have asked a better question to make my point. We absolutely positively do not, as a rule, even ask for options. I do not want to work with any artist that doesn't want to work with us. Um, I want it to be something they choose to do and something mm. they are not obligated to do. Mm. The reason is when I was a manager, the anger that my clients would have mm -hmm. when they went from being a nobody to a somebody and then being obligated to perform within a crappy deal, A, life's too short. I don't want to deal with that bullshit. Uh, two, I, I'm, I'm allowed to curse, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, and then two, probably should have asked that a, a while ago. Uh, and then two, um, like, I don't want to work with a comedian that doesn't want to work with me. You know, like, like yeah. that's just going to be 
Like we have enough money. We have enough success mm. so to force a comedian to work with us. It, it's just not, it's not fair. I guarantee you 90% of our deals, we could get the comedians to agree to at least a plus one. Sure. We have never asked. I never will ask. And I guarantee you the first time there's a CEO of the company that's not me, that will be one of the first things they change about our deals. But I, I'm not going to change it. So no, well, we've never done a plus one, let alone a plus four. I love that. And and that, I mean, artists uh, love that and love you for that. And, and you know, we talk about all the time uh, that artists that are struggling with their labels and they feel bound to it. I mean, Prince said uh, major labels are like slavery. I would encourage every artist not to sign a major label. On the music side, it's well documented that um, artists don't appreciate those uh, draconian deals that lock them in for sometimes 10 albums sometimes that are that could be 20 years, 30. You know, it's craziness. So that's great to hear. Um Question number two about how the deals are structured. Um, is there an advance versus royalties? Is it a recoupable? And then what's the royalty split? So we have over 2,000 albums. Okay. Uh, I think we have one record where the artist doesn't get back end. Okay, one. so it was it was purchased outright. You own the rights. No, and, and no, no. There was a lawsuit. Oh, um, just kidding. <laughs> but that, was part, that was part of the settlement. Okay, um, got it, got it. <laughs> so, but my point was the other one thousand nine hundred ninety nine. <laughs> everybody gets got it back end. Okay. Um, eighty percent of the time we pay. No, seventy five percent of the time mm -hmm. we provide an advance. Twenty five percent okay. of the time it's just rev share. Okay. And what are we talking? And it fluck we never ever go below 30%. And uh, again, on which side? I, on our side. Um, meaning my company never takes less than 30%. Okay. And again, I guarantee you there's some deals I'm forgetting about, but 99.9999999% of our deals, we never go below 30%. Mm -hmm. And we never go above I think 70%. And I would say that less than 0.1% of our deals are at even 70%. If we're getting 70%, that means I really don't want the album, yeah. um, but I'm doing a favor to somebody. Um, Got it. But I would say 60 to 70% of our deals are 50-50. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, that's a yeah, right. That's quite a fluctuation from uh, thirty to seventy percent. But uh, fifty fifty, um, that makes sense. That that's the majority. Um, that's if, yeah. If I, if I can address that for a second, sure. and this goes back to what I was saying before, sure. Where a lot of what I learned uh, as a manager, I use now uh, while mm -hmm. running, you know, the company. We we don't. I, I do not believe. In this situation, in the topic we're discussing, yes, I don't care about precedent. Like I feel like business in general, especially Hollywood, is obsessed with precedent, mm. and it's stupid mm -hmm. because maybe not stupid, but it's short-sighted because you are talking about artists. Mm. To there's no profession in the world except for maybe astronauts where like one shoe fits all, like or one size fits all, like every deal is different. By the way, dude, I've done deals with the same comedian where in 2015, he or she got fucking 80% or not 80%, mm -hmm. but let's say got 30, let's say that, let's say in 2015, a comedian got 70%. Uh -huh. And then I did another deal with them in 2017 where they got 30%. Oh, wow. And you would say, well, why did it go down? Yeah. Well, maybe they were going through a divorce and the advance was tripled. Uh huh. Maybe they had cooled off and I didn't want to do a deal for another album. And they wanted it so badly, they said, name your price. Mm. Um, and normally I wouldn't do that. Um, cause again, I, I just want everybody to be happy. I don't mm -hmm. want, I always, again, and this is because I was a manager. 
Um, the Comedy Cellar in New York at mm -hmm. three in the morning, mm -hmm. you do not want those comedians sitting there having crap, no offense, but crappy uh, cheese sticks and nachos. The food there is actually very good, but at three in the morning, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, whatever. Um, but you don't now I'm going to get a call from Gnome. Uh, but uh, the food's great. The food's great. The food's great. I love I love the food. Uh, but uh, you, you don't want these comedians at three in the morning sitting around a table saying how your company sucks and yes. you're stealing money or you're. Yes. Your your the Prince quote about slavery and all right. that stuff. Like we lose money when those conversations happen. Mm -hmm. There are comedians out there that hate my guts as a mm. human being. They hate me. But I have heard many times in those three in the morning conversations where a comedian, a very respected comedian, will say, I hate Brian. He's a horrible person. But they're honest, they're fair, they pay on time. And even though I hate Brian, you can trust him. <laughs> and like, I hate that I'm saying this because I hate Brian, but <laughs> they'll take good care of you. So that's why I have a lot of these rules, because it may seem like we're losing money in yeah. the, that day or that week or that year. But in the long term, that three in the man, three a.m. chatting, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if it's positive, it will make more money over the lifetime of the label. I love that. And that's the opposite of how it goes in the music industry, where they're usually like, I, I love my AR, I love the people at the label but they're unethical and their contracts uh, confusing. And, and not only that, but they are um, predatory and they got me to sign away all my rights and my firstborn child, but man, are they nice people. <laughs> so, you know, I would, I think we'd all prefer the former of, uh, you know, uh, they might not um, like someone as a person, but as long as they're ethical and do good business, that's what we can hope for uh, when we're, engaging in business relationships and business partnerships because that's what it is exactly. um g getting back to the deal um now is break down the royalties a little bit more so is it if you give somebody let's just say i'm throwing out random numbers i have no concept of ballpark in the comedy industry but let's just say you give somebody a hundred thousand dollar advance um and it's a 50 50 deal does it work like the music industry where uh you need to make back, you need to make essentially $200,000 gross uh, before you start paying the 50-50 split. Is that how well, it works? No, no, not for us. Okay. Um, how does it work? And just to, again, I can tell you like specifics, which, and I do too. Um, we have paid $500 advances. Mm -hmm. uh, our biggest advance we've ever paid was $7.5 Wow. So it literally <laughs> fluctuates between 500 and 7.5. Okay. Um, so just again, give you a sense of scale. Sure. So um, it, it's not 2X. It's, I would say it's, if our all in number to produce, to make the advance, produce the album and or special, let's just take a safe number because I'm bad at math. Mm -hmm. Let's say that cost us $1,000. Mm -hmm. The artist would start seeing back end at about $112. I don't understand. So oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I forgot that I said a thousand. Yeah. Um, at, uh, <laughs> wait, hold on. At, Eleven $1 hundred and twelve dollars. I got it. Okay, so you make so back a thousand dollars. There's yeah. basically a ten percent distribution fee on our deals, mm. um, which is what you know. That's the money we use to actually do what we do. Sure. So once that is caught, so that's what I'm saying. Like without that, it would be dollar for dollar. So the minute we're in the black the profit starts. So my question, and maybe this, uh, it doesn't work this way. In music, uh, the reason why I said $200,000 for a $100,000 advance was because um, the artist 
you they only get to pay down their account based on their royalty amount. So if their royalty amount is 50%, and let's say I'm the artist and you give me $100,000. If if we make $100,000 gross, I've only paid down my royalty account $50,000. So I still have, you know, another 100,000 to go that we split 50/50 before I start earning on that. So it essentially $200,000 needs to come in for me to start earning another dollar after you paid me 100,000. Does that make sense? Does that work that way or, or are you paying yes. from dollar 1? Yes. Um it's it's funny the video and the audio are slightly different in this oh, okay. regard and okay. and again to be completely blunt with you if you had asked me this five years ago i could give you an answer like that with all the details sure um this topic i'm a little hazy on but like i said i it's not dollar for dollar yeah but it's also not we, what you just said is a pretty, a much more extreme version of what we do. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? Sure. Yeah. It's, and, and it's similar in music where, uh, licensing sync licensing, you know, for, for film and TV, it's, it's, um, pretty much it's the licensing side is very different from quote unquote, the sales side, which is now streams, but essentially you get paid from whatever money comes in, they split that from dollar one on the video side. Where yeah, that's it's not, not first dollar. Audio like audio. it's not Tom Cruise with a Top Gun two. Yeah, um, <laughs> but no, I mean it's it's as much as possible. Our costs get covered, sure. and then the back end starts. And again, okay, got it. And I just want to be clear: like I'm not sitting here saying like I'm some altruistic, like artsy fartsy. I want love and kumbaya and all that. Yeah. It really does come down to when I was a manager, I saw how dumb a lot of the deals were and how they were designed to piss off the artist in yeah. success. So a lot of why we do the deals we do is my reaction to what I mm. perceive to be stupid business traditions. That's mm -hmm. number one. But number two, like, I really think people and artists in particular, if you look them in the eye and you tell them up front, here's the good news, here's the bad news. You're a grown up. Remember that you are a grown up. And when you take that pen and you sign that contract, yeah, it means you're cool with the bad news. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you something crazy. I am so anal about this topic about communicating effectively bad news up front because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I am so concerned with that 3 a.m. Uh, chatter at the at the at the cellar. Yeah. Um, by the way, it's not just the cellar. It's, you know, the sure. comedy store in L.A. Um, in our contracts at the back, there is a literally every my lawyers Everybody thought I was insane to do this. My lawyers told me nobody's going to sign this, Brian. Nobody has even questioned it. Our last page is a list of all the quote unquote bad things in the deal for the artist. And it's just repeating what could piss them off five years later. And it literally says, you understand, blah, 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 and they have to initial it. So every contract, they sign the contract, uh -huh. and then they have to initial, I think it's eight things, and those eight things literally are all the bad stuff that they could be mad about later. And oh like gosh. I said, everybody told me I was nuts, <laughs> and nobody, nobody, first of all, nobody has refused to sign it, Couple mm -hmm. lawyers, maybe every now and then, are like, "What the fuck is this? He's right. signing a contract. <laughs> like, why do you need that?" And yeah. we will tell them openly. We, and by the way, why do you think we do this? Yeah. We had a comedian who went nuts and like was like, "You didn't say this. You didn't say that." And blah blah blah, and was saying all this bullshit at one of those three in the morning conversations. Mm. And I'm like, not only did we not say anything you're saying we said. Yeah. Not only is everything you're complaining about in the contract, yeah. you signed it. So 
we added this thing for extra, for lack of a better expression, moral protection. Oh my God. So that if anyone complains, we can say, you initialed, yeah. we shined a spotlight on this for you. Ugh. What a novel concept. I mean, that's the thing. In, in all the record contracts that I've seen, you know, especially the major record contracts that are 100 pages long, they're essentially trying to fool you, trick you, and confuse you into signing their terms and to hide all the bad stuff on page 73 and that you just won't find or your lawyer will miss. And then they make the same arguments it's like, well, you signed the contract. It's yeah, I didn't have a gun to your head when you signed the contract. And every artist is just like, it was a hundred pages of legalese. You expect me to understand that and to read that? And like, okay, my attorney missed it because they were sleep deprived and had seven other clients and I was a low priority and this was my first record contract that I signed when I was 18. And you're saying it's my fault 15 years later that I'm stuck to you because like you hid all these things that I didn't know about, my lawyer didn't know about and missed and all that stuff. That shit happens all the time. And that's why all these lawsuits are flying around in the music industry and that's like i hope every person who runs the label in the industry right now the music industry right now listens to brian and takes this that would be brilliant i want to see at the back of a record contract all of the bad stuff that's fantastic yeah. if there's one thing to take away from that every record contract in the future needs to have all the bad stuff on the final page i fucking love that that's by the great. way like, if you like that you're gonna love this <laughs> our contracts i mean they're eight or nine pages long as they should be. Yeah. yeah like, and by the way, I say this all the time. I say this privately all the time. I've said it publicly. And I mean this. And by the way, again, I'm saying this to you from experience. Yes. I didn't wake up and have this like altruistic opinion. The worst thing anybody can ever say to me when we're going to try and get a deal done. The worst thing. I'm not using a lawyer. Anytime someone says they're not using a lawyer, I'm like, that is a super duper bad idea. Right. <laughs> Go find a lawyer. Yep. This is not a good idea, but it's better than not using a lawyer. I will give mm -hmm. you a list. Here's mm. five lawyers who I trust. Um, you should not hire a lawyer I'm recommending, but right. <laughs> it is better for you to have one of them do it yeah. than no lawyer. Yeah. Um, and I would say... 85% of the time I can convince them to hire a lawyer. 20% of the time it's one of the lawyers I recommend. 80% of that group, they find their own lawyer. Yeah, but yeah. You need this shit's complicated, man. Yeah, and as you should. I mean, no no artist uh should use a lawyer necessarily recommended by the party that they are negotiating with, but yeah. I appreciate the intention and I understand that, you know, you're trying to have your artists protect themselves and educate them to protect themselves, which they definitely need to and should. And yes, don't try to negotiate a contract without a lawyer. That's just kind of business. And, and, and by the way, but yeah. If they do use one of our recommended lawyers, they the artist needs to not only sign a letter to the lawyer that they're okay with the conflict of interest right we add a paragraph or something or a section to our deals also making them initial that yeah. um like that because again i again it's like you look at you brought up prince mm -hmm. like how much money was lost by the label their lives were probably shortened. All those weekend and Thanksgiving calls while this artist who will be celebrated till the end of our civilization changes his name to a symbol. Mm -hmm. Give the guy some more fucking money. Right. Like you have, like I'm, I always wonder like maybe because I come from like a real low middle-class upbringing mm -hmm. and because I made like 12 grand my first year in LA kind of stuff. Like, <laughs> You don't need every dime. Like, yeah. you just don't. And yeah. you will make more money if there's good word of mouth. Mm. So why are you fucking with Prince? Like or any artist, to be honest. Prince, 90% of every dollar that comes in of the profit, having him on your label yeah. generates so much more money 
For your other records, it gives you power when you're negotiating with Sirius. It gives you power. Like, give the guy. It's his songs. Right. (laughs) Like, I understand if some guy comes up to you you've never heard of and you got to spend millions of dollars to turn him or her into a superstar. Mm -hmm. Yes. The label, the studio, they deserve to make a boatload of cash for that risk. But if you're working with someone who's already famous, already successful, give them the lion's share of the money. Like we do the contract, tear it up. <laughs> I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that. It's great because sometimes you need an outside perspective, someone who uh, outside the music industry, who also, you know, you say don't care so much about precedent and has seen it from the other side, seen it from the management side, seen it from on the other side of the table, what artists go through and those 3M conversations are like to actually make the change that's necessary and ethical, frankly. Um, I think a lot of these deals are are quite unethical on the major label level. Um, still to this day, you know, hopefully things are are starting to change a bit. Um, so Brian, what are what are you focusing on these days? What are you working on? What's kind of the next steps? So uh, you know, again, we're kind of kind of a little bit of a weird company, but the the stand up comedy act. Well, it started with management. Mm-hmm. Then we built the. Uh, audio and video distribution systems for the mm-hmm. stand-up. Uh, we have t- taken that money and started doing documentaries and scripted shows. Um, and then, yes. you know, over to hopefully the next one to three years, we'll be making our second feature, then our third and fourth feature, all scripted, cool. and then do the same thing with um, with scripted TV shows. Nice. So. We now own the same. So we're basically now doing in documentary series um, what we did in stand up comedy 12 mm. years ago. So, five years ago, uh, 99% of our production work for television uh, was work for hire, where we made a show, gave it to Netflix or gave it to History Channel or whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we never made another dime and Mm -hmm. they controlled it Mm -hmm. now about 60% of our documentaries we own and we Mm. control and we just license License the way we used to do it with standup specials. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we're basically, I came out here to build a studio. Like most people come out here to be a director, a writer, an actor. Um, I came out to build a studio from scratch. Um, obviously, because I did not own one when I got here. Uh, So it would have to be by scratch (laughs) or from scratch. So that's, we're just moving up the value chain and making bigger and bigger things because we can afford to make things now that we could not have afforded to make three years ago. But if you can allow me to make a shameless plug for a second, uh, I get asked now incessantly, uh, are we going to stop making stand-up comedy? Mm. No, never. As long as I'm in charge, uh, and I'll be in charge until I retire or sell the company, and I don't think I'll ever sell the company. So for at least another 15 to 20 years, uh, we will be making stand-up comedy at scale. Amazing. And uh, I'm sure every every comedian listening it just took a sigh of, of relief as well because uh, this is yeah it's it's very appreciated in the artist world um, this this model that you have well Brian this has been an incredibly fascinating conversation I'm I'm so happy that uh, we got to chat and I'm happy that hey. you are the first person outside the music industry that I had on the show because you shined a, a really great light on um, what could be. Uh, and and how things could work in the music industry because it's working for you in the comedy industry and it, it could work across the board um, in in this ethical way. Uh, I have one final question that I ask everybody on the show. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, adjust it slightly for you. But what does it mean to make it in the entertainment industry? For me, our library provides enough money to make new content without having to go sell things. The amount of money, the amount of time I have spent in my career, and I do as recently as this morning when I pitched a show, 
mm-hmm. on selling things is staggering. Mm-hmm. So to be able to never have to sell again and just green light that, that, and we're getting close. Uh, I mean, on stand up comedy, I would never, I, we don't sell anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we practically, the only reason we do work for hire anymore mm-hmm. is because it's a relationship. Mm-hmm. Like, Jim Gaffigan, we've produced his last seven specials. We're producing his eighth special in uh, later this year. It's not a lot of profit, sure, but it would break my heart if somebody else was making a Jim Gaffigan special. So other than people like Jim Gaffigan or Tom Papa or just people that we've worked with for a long time, I mean, we really are only making stuff now that we're self-financing and we can distribute. Amazing. Brian Volkweiss, thank you so much. That was great. Thank you. A lot of fun, man. Great question. Thank you. Bye. Today's episode was edited by Maxton Hunter, theme music by Brassroots District, and produced by all the great people at Ari's Take.